said, Amen. 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 May be seated. I am so glad to be here with you today, and I'm so grateful that you're joining us online. And Parker Campus, thanks for joining us as well. We're excited about what God is going to do. So you guys who are watching us online, stay involved, interact with each other, talk while I'm preaching, uh, but uh, stay connected with other believers in Christ. We are continuing in our sermon series. Now, you guys are not allowed to talk to each other. You got to just not talk. Pay attention. We are continuing in our sermon series uh, from the book of Acts. Uh, you can turn in your Bible or your Bible app to Acts chapter 10, uh, beginning at verse 1. We're going to walk through verses 48, but we're not going to read them all. If you're using one of our Bibles found underneath the seat in front of you, or if you're at the Parker campus, you can jump up right now and go grab a Bible uh, located in the back of the room and turn to page 1091. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or call your own, we want you to take a Bible home with you, read it and begin to apply it to your life because we are convinced that if we read God's word and apply God's word, he will change our lives. And we love celebrating life change here at Calvary. Uh, God has been so good to us. Now, uh, guess what? Pastor Chad is supposed to be preaching this message right now, uh, but he gone and got the COVID. So uh, he, now he's made a very humble and a request as he is at home. Uh, his wife has him barricaded in a bedroom and he's made a very humble request. As you pray for a speedy recovery, he's asked that you ask God to provide him with peanut butter chocolate ice cream. I know he was uh, grieved to share that concern, that prayer need. He, now notice he didn't say, act, honestly, he did not ask pe that he would get a speedy recovery. I added that. He basically said, tell the people to bring me chocolate peanut butter ice cream. So that's the way Chad is. Uh, so let's, but we will be praying for him. And also uh, we have a couple other staff members that are concerned. They're practicing quarantine. So we do want to encourage you. If you do sense the sniffles or if you do sense that you might have uh, something, wear a mask uh, for those around you and, uh, and be a blessing to other people as well. Uh, I don't encourage isolating if you sense that you might have it, but just put a mask on. And then if you're sick, you're sick and you probably will isolate anyway. So... Uh, last week, I shared a little bit about my childhood story of growing up with an alcoholic dad that would abuse me. I want to share a little bit about where I fall in the uh, child line. I have two sisters in front of me, and then there's me, and then there's a brother, and then a sister, and another brother. So there are six of us total. Now, if you're a birth order person, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know if I'm the middle child. I don't know if I'm, you know, because I'm the third out of six, but my brother's also third from the youngest. So I don't know what that is. So if you're a birth order person, please tell me. I've always considered myself kind of the firstborn because I was the firstborn son. I don't know. So one night my dad was drinking. He got my brother and I together and he sat us down at the kitchen table and he looked me dead in the eye and he said this. You are my favorite son. Then he looked at my younger brother, who's just 13 months younger or so. He looked at him and he said, you're number two. You'll never be number one. He's my number one son. Can I just say that is a terrible way to parent? Uh, terrible. Uh, throughout our childhood, my brother and I talk about sibling rivalry. Uh, we constantly fought one another, whether we were fighting verbally or whether we were duking it out in the yard. It was nothing but fist fights, cussing fights and fighting. But the great thing is now years later, we have both surrendered our lives to Jesus. And of all my siblings, I'm closest with him than I am the others. So now is our time to be interactive. Raise your hand if you thought that maybe your parents had a favorite child growing up. All right, thank you for your honesty. Raise your hand if you think maybe that favorite child was you. Raise your hand. Uh-huh. All right, raise your hand if you know it was you. All right, now I want you to stick your tongue out at somebody around you. When parents play favorites with their children, it's destructive. It creates tension, fighting, jealousy, division, and isolation, unless you're the only child in the family. 
Did you know, and the reason why I bring this up is that the Jewish people of Jesus' day considered themselves God's favorite people. And they had good reason to. The Old Testament teaches us that God promised to bless the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Israelites. He blessed them. He protected them. He guided them. And even Jesus himself were Jewish. The 12 apostles were Jewish. So it makes sense that in Jesus' day, and in these days when Jewish people were surrendering their lives to Jesus uh, and they were being baptized, that they considered Jesus a Jewish savior. And some of them almost exclusively believed that Jesus was the savior for the Jews, hence king of the Jews. Now we understand why many of them thought that way, but as we're gonna learn from our passage of scripture today, these early disciples were wrong. Uh, or as Colonel Sanders from Waterboy would say, mama was wrong again. That joke fell flat. <laughs> I tried to tie it in with siblings and worked its way through. So if you have a problem with that joke, Chad wrote that joke and I just had to go with it. So finish this sentence for me. When Jesus was leaving the earth, Right As Jesus was heading off the earth, as he was ascending into heaven, he looked at his disciples and said, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, right? Of all the nations, go into all the world, but make, make disciples of all the nations. And so far in the book of Acts, the disciples were really good at making disciples in Jerusalem. I mean, they were doing awesome at making disciples in Jerusalem. Even after the persecution, they were still doing great of making disciples of Jewish people, but they were failing at reaching other nations. Then we get to Acts chapter 10 and God moves in such a powerful way in Acts chapter 10. In fact, that's the reason why you and I have uh, been able to be changed today. The reason why you and I are saved today is a result of what God did in Acts chapter 10. So let me give you the background. There's a story. There's a man named Cornelius and he was not Jewish. Uh, say that with me. Cornelius was not Jewish. Thank you. He was a Roman officer. He was a Gentile. Uh, he was not a believer in Jesus, but he did believe that there was a creator God. Uh, he did talk to God. He offered sacrifices to God, but he did not know God as his personal savior. So one day Cornelius is talking to God and God began to speak back to Cornelius. And God said, send some men into the city of Joppa. Look for a man named Simon Peter and tell him that I want to talk with him. So he did. He grabbed the servants. He told them that. And the servants started their trip into Jerusalem. Now, the next day, as the servants are headed to Jerusalem to find Peter, Peter is talking to God and he has a vision and it's going to seem odd to you and me at first. In this vision, God lowers this big tablecloth down, this big picnic blanket down to Peter and in front of Peter, inside that blanket, every animal uh, was, there were animals, there were reptiles and there were birds inside this blanket and they all had one thing in common. It was an animal that the Jewish people were forbidden to eat. Whether it was a reptile, whether it was whatever it was, animal or a bird, whatever was in that picnic blanket, the Jews were forbidden to eat. They were considered unclean. So Peter being a devout Jew, he would never consider killing or eating these animals. Then heard God's voice say to him, arise, kill and eat. Now, let me ask you a question. There are many types of food that you probably would never eat. So we're gonna figure out your palate today, okay? Raise your hand if you would eat frog legs. Okay, frog legs taste like chicken, not too bad, right? Raise your hand if you would eat horse meat. <laughs> a, few, a few guys are like, yeah, why not? Raise your hand if you would eat a possum or a rat. Okay. Very, very few of us. And pray for those that raise their hands. <laughs> now, the picnic blanket, this bag of food, this blanket of food that was on the ground in front of Peter was just as gross and offensive as some of those animals were to you. 
So Peter argued with God. I'm not going to eat that food. I'm a Jew. I've kept myself clean. We don't eat unclean food. And God said emphatically, what I have declared as clean is clean. Eat it. And by the way, some men are arriving and I want you to go with them. So the men sent by Cornelius, uh, so the men sent by Cornelius, they arrive. Peter travels back with them to the home of Cornelius. And once there, Cornelius tells Peter that he summoned him to come to him because God told him to. Now for Peter, this vision of this unclean food began to make sense. And he understands that God is telling Peter to share the gospel with non-Jewish people. Okay, that's the whole point of the vision of the blanket of food. So Peter took the opportunity to share the good news about Jesus with Cornelius and with his friends and his family. And now we're going to pick up reading in chapter 10, verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. This is incredibly significant for us today. Did you see what Peter, the Jewish man from the, from the descendants of the Israelites said, the one who had been handpicked by Jesus to be an apostle, very first thing that he said, he began the gospel presentation with these words, there is no partiality with God. None. There is no favoritism with God. Make no mistake about it, that was a difficult statement for Peter to make. He was a Jew. He was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was chosen by God. He was handpicked by Jesus, one of the 12, and he was also part of Jesus' inner circle. And now through this blanket vision, God helped Peter understand that God had created all people. God loves all people, and therefore God has no favorites. Now I wanna tell you a secret. I actually thought that I was God's favorite as a younger believer. Um, after I surrendered my life to Jesus, I began reading my Bible and I was praying in the morning before I would go to work. I'd read my Bible at the end of the day and I would be praying. And I went to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. I was telling people about Jesus. And on top of those outside visible signs, I sensed a nearness to God unlike anything I'd ever experienced before in my life. I mean, I, I really, as a younger believer, felt so close to God. Whenever somebody would teach that God does not have favorites, I wanted to jump up and I wanted to shout, yes, he does. I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. I know him. He talks to me. I listen to him. He teaches me from his word. And I, can I just tell you, 
I think that all of us as growing believers, there's times where we sense, gosh, God's just speaking to me. God's just speaking right directly to me that, that I'm his favorite. When you're growing in your relationship with God, you can't help but feel special. But the truth is, there is no partiality with God. Forgiveness for sins is for everybody. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, what's your takeaway from that? Like Peter, we are to love regardless of color regardless of our political preference, regardless of our race, regardless of our religion, regardless of our nationality. And it's our responsibility to make the gospel known to all people. That's why the mission of Calvary is very simple, to lead people to a life-changing relationship with him. We are convinced that the gospel is for every resident of Lake Havasu City and Parker. We are convinced that the gospel is for every person in Arizona. We are convinced that God can change anybody's life. And that's why our mission is that simple. That's why we love all people, even the ones that we don't want to, even the ones that bother us and irritate us and drive us crazy. And I'm not talking about your spouse. We are called to love all people because God loves them all. God loves each and every one. And I understand that we're living in a divided world today. We are divided over how to respond to COVID. And now with the cases rising in Lake Havasu, we'll see some more of that. People are gonna be yelling about masks. Some people are not gonna be yelling about masks. It's gonna be happening. We're divided about the election. In some areas of our country, and maybe even in your home, we're divided about race. We're divided about wealth. We're divided by state lines. We're divided by borders with our countries. We are divided by languages. In Havasu and in Parker, we're divided by -by side-by-sides, four-wheelers and Jeeps. (laughs) But these lines, these borders, these parameters that we've placed around people, should not hinder followers of Jesus because as we see in this passage, Jesus is a wrecking ball for unity. Jesus is a wrecking ball for unity. Look at Acts 10 verse 45. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. I love that because now all of a sudden they're realizing, wait a minute, We thought we were the chosen people. We're the Israelites. Jesus was king of the Jews. And now we're seeing Gentiles give their lives to Jesus and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let me give you a little bit more history about the tension between Gentiles and the Israelites. For hundreds of years, Jews and Gentiles did not care for one another. In the first century temple, when the temple was built, there were certain walls. There were like layers of walls that led into the inner temple. The Gentiles were only permitted outside the furthest most temple wall. They, we were not allowed in the temple at all. They were outside of the wall. They were never allowed to enter the temple beyond that first wall. The hostility was so severe that archeologists found an inscription in the wall of the outermost court where the Gentiles were. And this is what it read. Whoever is captured past this point will have himself to blame for his subsequent death. Now, if you're having a hard time grasping the hostility of those words, imagine that on the outside of our church wall here at Sweetwater or outside at Parker, that the words written on the outside of the wall said, black man, climb over this wall and you will die. Or white man, climb over this wall and you will die. Or Latino, climb over this wall and you will die. See, that's how much hostility existed between the Gentiles and the Israelites. 
sharing the good news of Jesus with the Gentiles was a big deal because everybody who was not an Israelite was a Gentile. Everybody who was not a special child of God, a chosen nation, they considered Gentiles. And that's why we read in verse 45 that the Jewish Christians were amazed. Oh, God loves them too. They were blown away. And from that point on, Jesus would no longer be known exclusively as the King of the Jews. Now Jesus would be recognized as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords among people. Unity of people comes from forgiveness of sins. Paul wrote in Galatians, uh, the apostle Paul wrote this in Galatians 3.28, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus from his sacrifice will save people from every tribe, every language, every nation. Jesus has made all of us who are followers of Christ one big happy family. So if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, but you hate somebody because of their race, you cannot have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Or if you hate somebody because you don't like their politics, I wonder if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you because God loves all and he has sent us into the world to all the nations. In preparation for today's message, Chad had written about his own experience with seeing God bring unity through believing in Jesus uh, throughout the world. As you know, Pastor Chad has been on many mission trips and I didn't want to cut out this part of his sermon, you know, because I had his sermon. I'm looking at him I'm like, OK, I got to preach this, but I got to make it my own. And so I'm, I'm whacking out things. and I'm adding my own stuff. And uh, I sense the spirit of God lead me to leave this in. Listen to Pastor Chad's words as he says, as he writes. I've seen Jesus breaking through barriers in the former Soviet Union and sharing Jesus on a military base with soldiers who were taught to hate us like we were taught to hate them. And I saw them respond to the message of hope. I've seen Jesus breaking through barriers, barriers worshiping with Nigerian pastors, joyfully expressing their love for Jesus in song and dance. Chad says, I tried to sing, Pastor Chet danced. He said, I've been blessed by fellow believers living in utmost poverty in Mozambique, encouraged by fearless Christians living under the threat of persecution in China and amazed at the miraculous testimonies of former Muslim refugees in Greece. See, when your identity in Christ is a priority for you, that you drop politics, you drop being American, you drop being from Lake Havasu, you drop being an Arizonan, when nothing else matters to you except your identity in Christ, then you are going to love like Christ loves everybody. You're gonna have a love for all people because love changes the way we see people. Ch uh, love changes the way that we see ourselves and it changes the way that we respond and we react to other people. And remember what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not focused on itself and love never fails because there's no favoritism and there's no partiality with God. As followers of Jesus, you and I love and we lead differently. We live as though prejudice doesn't occur. We see the heart because God sees the heart. We love the person regardless of who they are, whether they're wealthy or poor, whether they're black or white or Latino. We love them all because the gospel brings unity. And as we share the gospel, we share hope. 
And finally, in this story, we see that grace is available to you as well. Grace is available to you as well. Look at verse 43. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, whatever has been done to you, no matter your background, your successes, your failures, God offers you forgiveness and hope. Peter said, everyone who believes in the name of Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Salvation is not based on your heritage, your ethnicity, education, language, employment, criminal record. Salvation is offered to anyone who believes in the name of Jesus and surrenders their life to him. What that looked like for me was in 1991, I knelt down and I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I told him that I was sorry for what I had done. I'd sorry for how I lived, rejecting him, knowing about him and never giving my life to him. And then I invited him to be my Lord and savior. And I surrendered my life to him by simply saying, I give up, I turn my life over to you. Walk with me the rest of the day or rock with me the rest of my life. Anyone can be saved. Anyone can be changed. I'm living proof of that. In fact, if you surrendered your life to Jesus and you've already done that, would you raise your hand? You're living proof of that as well. You're living proof that Jesus can change anybody and he can break down any barrier, any wall of hostility that exists. So our prayer team is gonna be here at the close of this last song. And I want you to let you know why they're here. Our prayer team will be here for those of you in this room that have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus. If you would like to be saved, if you would like to yield your life to Christ, if you would like to give up, stop trying to do this on your own and receive forgiveness for your sins and a second chance at life, Our prayer team will be here at the close of the last song. They would love to pray with you and lead you to life change in the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, we wanna say thank you for the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus breaks down barriers, that Jesus breaks down hostility, that Jesus can work through any border, that Jesus can work through any person, that Jesus destroys walls of hostility. God, we pray today for those in this room that have not yet surrendered their lives to Jesus. God, we, we pray and we ask that they would turn their lives over to Jesus and experience forgiveness of sins. Help them to find hope in you. Help them to find their joy in you. And Lord, reassure them that you can change them. Reassure them that you can make them a new creation. Remind them of the words of what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Father, we love you. We thank you for the way that you've worked And we invite you to continue to change lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.